Psalm 39. The Bible says, I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle, while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence, I held my peace, even from good, and my sorrow was dry. My heart was hot within me, while I was musing the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue, Lord, make me to know mine end, and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made me days as a hand breedeth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vainly. Selah. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches, knoweth not who shall gather them. Now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I was dumb, I opened not my mouth, because thou didst it. Remove thy stroke away from me. I, I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. When thou with rebukes doth correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume every like a moth. Surely every man is vanity, say love. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner, all my fathers were. O spare me, that I may recover strength, before I go hence and be no more. I'll go, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everything that you've done for us, and I, we pray that you would just bless Brother Josh, help him deliver a really good message. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> Psalm 39, another one of these moments where you catch David, and just one of the things and reasons why you, you love him so much is a as a character, as, as a real man in the scriptures. It, it starts off there, Psalm 139, verse 1, he said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. And I love David because he's, he's immediately kicks off this psalm with it with a sense of inner reflection. It's, it's my, my, my ways, tongue, mouth. These need to be kept. These need to have heed given to them. It was in Job that uh, he made the statement, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? So he made a covenant in advance of knowing the temptations that would be before him to, to, to not only see, but also to think upon it. It's almost like, like the, they say the eyes are the window to the soul in Job's picture. And he says, he says, I made a covenant with mine eyes that I'm not going to look at the woman. I'm not going to see with the eyes and behold the flesh that is before me and be tempted by that. So why then should I think upon it? Why should I, why should I, if I'm not going to let it go into my eyes, why would I let my mind meditate upon these things? Job's making a covenant with a body part, with a member that he knows will potentially lead him into trouble, into, into turmoil, into sin. We can do the same thing, I believe, uh, as, as David here is making that covenant I said, I will take heed. I will keep. And he's talking about his ways and his tongue and his mouth. These are, these are things, my steps, my ways, I can get into all sorts of trouble. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 26 says, The way of the Lord is strength to the upright. So there is clearly God's way that is strength to those that are upright, morally righteous, walking in that good way. But our ways, in, in opposition to the Lord's ways, quite often are selfish and quite often are vain. I would rather walk in the ways of God, which gives strength to me as I'm seeking to be upright, than walk after my own ways and my own step, which are always selfish. They're always vain. There's always seeking self-glory. He says also that you need to take heed to something. Go to James chapter 2. Keep your finger in Psalm 39. In James chapter 2, James chapter 2 deals with what he is going to take heed to, what he is going to keep by covenant here. James chapter 2, again, looking at Job, I'm going to read for you. In 34 and verse 21, he said, 
For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his going. So in another place in Proverbs 5.21, it records that God pondereth all his going. So referring to men and our steps and our ways, we constantly have God seeing them and pondering them. Think for that for think about that for a moment. When when you decide whether you're going to go this way or that way or what you're going to do with your day. If you're following after your ways, understand that God sees that. When you're following after your own paths, understand that God is pondering these things in his own heart considering these things, considering your motives, your reasons, your, your justifications for why you do certain things. His eyes are upon the ways of men. He pondereth all his goings. So that's why we need to take heed to our own ways as David was promising himself, stating it openly, I will take heed. I will mind my ways. Next he says, I will keep my tongue and my mouth. He says, I will keep them bridled. In James chapter 1 and verse 26, it says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So the religious people, and we got a good group of them here, if they can't keep their own tongue bridled, then they have a vain religion. They have something missing in their ways and their walk with God. Religion is simply the outward show of what we believe in our heart. If we believe the Bible is true and we're walking after those ways, the religious points, um, the Bible records here that pure religion is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. That's love extending to the needy. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's keeping the commandments and, and doing according to the statutes that that God gives. If you can't even keep your own tongue, then we see it's a testimony to the fact that you have a vain, empty religion that is lacking something. You got to keep your tongue bridled. It's almost the first step to really growing in the things of God. James chapter 3 and in verse 2, James 3 and verse 2, it says, For in many things we offend. And this is familiar to all. We could go and preach a whole sermon on this. It says, In many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So while religion is seen as vain if you can't bridle your own tongue, God is also giving the option and the provision that, hey, unless you're perfect, you're going to have a tongue that offends. You're going to have words that come out of your mouth that slip. If you're perfect, if you're complete as a believer, you're also able, while you mind your tongue, to bridle your whole body. And we see suddenly your religion is not in vain. Your religion is acting out appropriately and seeking after the things of God and doing well by God. So the perfect bridles his whole body. But we see it starts with the tongue. It starts with keeping that thing, keeping the mouth and keeping the tongue. It's the beginnings of the whole ways of man. So David said in the psalm, he said, he said, I will, you know, I seek to, to keep my ways. I seek to be mindful of my own ways. But then he says, I'm going to keep my tongue and my mouth. We see that that should be the stepping stone to the whole thing. The whole doing, the whole acting out religiously has to be the keeping of the tongue. Verse 3, there's a likeness given here. It says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. So what's that saying? You bit the mouth so that the body does what it's supposed to. And that's exactly what the scriptures say. If you're perfect, you keep your tongue, and the whole body's able to be bridled as well. Verse 4 says, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, Yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. So this very little helm attached to the rudder is able to move about this great ship that's being driven by the winds. Again, the little member is what drives the whole object, the whole item. The body can be guided by the mouth being bridled. The ship can be guided by that helm doing what it's supposed to and being under the guidance of the governor. Even so, verse 5, the tongue is a little member that boasts of great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, 
a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. You see the, you see the, what the tongue does, how much it controls? If we can't keep our tongues, if we're constantly running our mouths and just losing track of the words that come from our mouth, it is a testimony of the religion. Why? Because your religion is your walk. It's your outward show of what you believe. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And even though you may be able to put on a good show religiously, if I see somebody that's running their mouth and constantly setting fires with their tongue, that world of iniquity running rampant, you see that the whole body is defiled. It's clear that the abundance of the heart is speaking what's in there, and therefore the religion is vain, and the whole course of that man, the whole guidance of that man is set on fire. Think about it. If the horse isn't bridled properly, and it's it's running loose, and it's not really it's not really strapped down, and it, the horse isn't going to follow where he's supposed to, where where the where the the rider is leading. In the same way, the ship. If all the if all the uh, the the helm mechanism and all that is kind of shaking and loose, and it's not more downright, so that when the governor turns, you're not going to get the ship to do what you want if everything isn't working correctly according to what's supposed to start the whole thing, and that is the tongue. Verse 7 says, For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith we curse men, which are made after the similitude of the Father, of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place water sweet and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive trees, either a vine figs? So can no fountain yield both salt water and fresh. That's saying that the abundance of the heart is speaking one thing, and if it's bitter, then what's in there can't be sweet. There's only one thing that can come out of a vessel. One object can come out of a vessel. And so if you are constantly trying to curse and bless, there is a problem here. And it starts with the tongue. And this is why you can go back to Psalm 139. This is why I find it so wise that David would start a psalm of reflection like this. I said, I will take heed to my ways, Psalm 39, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. He, he's, he's setting his mind in the right path that, hey, I need to understand that if I'm going to do anything in this life, if I'm going to walk before my God, honestly, I need to make sure I sin not with my tongue. I need to make sure that I'm keeping my mouth. And his example here is while the wicked is before me. While, while the world is before me. It's interesting because verse 2 then says, I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. That, that just kind of shows you that, that if you make a statement like, I'm going to keep my tongue, I'm going to keep my ways, I'm going to mind my mouth while the wicked is before me, that's, constant, that's pretty much all the time. You're always going to be in the presence of an unbeliever. You're always going to be in the presence of somebody that would be, that would be against the ways of God. The wicked isn't just your random unbeliever. The wicked is generally somebody who's an affront to God, who, who's rejected God. Maybe not to the point of being a reprobate, but this person is definitely bent in that direction. So he is dumb, David says, and he's got silence. But this is the right way to be in most scenarios, honestly, especially because our tongue is the way it is. By definition, of fire. By definition, a world of iniquity. By definition, the tongue is full of unruly and deadly poison. What a matter that thing kindleth when it's set to its own ways, its own devices. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 28 says, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. That means that even if you're a fool and you're ignorant, you have no concept of what's going on, if you just mind your mouth, if you just keep your mouth shut, you can be esteemed as if you have understanding. You can be esteemed and counted as if you are wise. 
One of the wisest things that we can do as believers in 90% of scenarios that we find ourselves in is just to keep our mouths shut. How often do we kindle fires? How often do we get ourselves in trouble? David kicks off this psalm and he's got it right. Hey, keep your mouth. Hey, take heed to your tongue. Don't sin with that thing because if you're sinning with that thing, I see your heart. Why? Because that's what is abundantly pouring out of your heart is what comes out of your mouth. So David here makes the statement, before the wicked, I'm going to keep my tongue. Before the wicked, I'm going to keep my mouth and take heed to these things. And he found himself here, before the wicked, just dumb with silence, holding his peace, even from saying good things. He's, he's just completely decided, I'm going to hold my peace. And what happened to him? His sorrow was stirred within him. Verse 3, it says, my heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. There's an interesting thing. I, I, you know, I don't follow Lent anymore, but in my infancy as a Christian, you know, you're supposed to uh, abstain from something. I think you get like a, an X on your forehead. We didn't do that whole thing. That's kind of the Catholic arm. But Protestants do something like Lent as well. They call it the same thing. And early in infancy of my Christianity, um, I guess I just figured I was going to be super zealous. But I, I actually fasted for those 20 days or whatever it is my voice <laughs> and I just decided that as as uh, Zechariah did when he heard the report of the child that would be born and believed it not he lost his voice for a time and so for a time again in my infancy taking part in that that, that ritual of Lent I kept my tongue and just just didn't say I wrote notes to my wife I communicated in that kind of way but that was just kind of my zeal and, and my, my my way that I could try to in my ignorance be as zealous as I could and, and do some of that and it was an interesting thing that I learned from all that was exactly that kind of just that the musing of it all you 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 meditate upon things longer the fire burns within you when you've got to write out your statements before you say them and I think some people are guilty about this when we get on our devices right somebody there's some sort of argument going on or computing you type it a whole bunch and you're like uh, I better back off <laughs> and you're like oh, and I don't know I, I don't know if you've seen that when you're kind of talking to somebody and it's a little bit of a heated discussion you'll see those little dots come up like they're saying something then it's gone <laughs> and it comes back up and they're and you know that you're just kind of brewing over what they're gonna say but honestly that's what happens when we learn to keep our tongues when we learn to be mindful of the things that come out of our mouth and how it can affect our walk spiritually and so the heart was hot within him while he was musing that fire burned he was dumb with silence even from good things that he would say because he set his mind to just keep quiet stop running his mouth but I like how it turns here he says I was musing the fire burned then spake I with my tongue. So the scenarios here is that he's before the wicked, okay? I'm sure he saw things that he wanted to rebuke. He wanted to correct. He really had to get off of his chest, even from good things. So he's musing. He's not talking. He's not speaking because he had set his mind that he would keep his mouth. He made a covenant with his tongue. He made a covenant with his mouth that he wasn't just going to run off. And so... It gets to the point where his heart is hot, there's that musing of the, and, and he's musing on these things, and the fire's burning, and he hasn't got it off his chest, and then it says this, then spake I with my tongue, then spake I, and so you're in front of the wicked, and so my mind goes to, if I wasn't going to read the whole rest of the context, it's just like, you know, I'm going to give these guys a piece of my mind. I've, I've been musing on these. I've been saving up some things that i got to say to you. And so he's going to be like, you wicked heathen, you wretched fools, you wicked sinners. And he's just going to flip off and blow up on these guys, right? He's just going to, he's going to let it all hang out. But it's interesting because he's, he's musing, that fire's burning within him. And, and you think in our flesh, if you're before somebody who's wicked day in, day out, you haven't said what you wanted to say. Because we all want to get our piece in. We want to get our word in, right? You would think that he's just going to blow up and let this guy have it. Instead, instead of giving him a peace of mind, he says, Then spake I. And what's that first word in verse 4? Lord. So instead of blowing up, instead of going after the wicked, instead of letting that fire burn up in him, you would expect, in my flesh I would, I want to get a piece out. I want to, finally I can say what I've been meaning to say, right? No, he says, then speak I, Lord, 
Make me to know mine end and the measure of my days what it is, that I may know how frail I am. After this time of keeping his mouth, after this time of musing on these things, after this time of not letting it all bubble out and just getting it out there, the first thing that came to David's heart to say was, Lord, call out to him in prayer. God, make me to know my ways. Make me to know my frailty. Make me to understand myself. Search me. We see that in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. How often have we seen David, yes, act out in the flesh, but when he writes, it's all about him trying to better himself, trying to grow as a Christian, trying to, trying to have a clean heart before God, even though he sinned and messed up like we all do. David often has that heart that says, search me, know me, that I may know me, that I may understand more about myself. What did he learn and what did he, he find out that he should know? The Bible records that he is frail and that he is vain. Verse 6, or verse 5. Behold, thou hast made my days as an hand breath, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity selah. And there's another musing. There's another space of meditation of thinking upon these things. David takes the time to not run his mouth, not let his heart spew out upon people, not attack everything, not say everything that comes to his heart, but rather to muse, let the fire burn within him. And then he comes to God and says, God, I need to know me. There's, there's something missing here. There's something wrong with me. And what he realizes is first and foremost that, that his days are as a hand breath. You know, what is that in the grass? Even in this room, how much is a hand breath? It's not much, right? His days are as a hand breath, the Bible records, and that's what he learned. He says, his age is as nothing before thee, next to the immortal God, next to the God that had no beginning and has no end. What are my days? My, my few and evil days that I live in this life. They're but nothing. They're but not. The days that span that hand breath, it's limited. The, the age and the experience that I have, it's of not. He says, man, every man, truly, verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. And isn't this what he taught, I believe, his son to learn? You know, he led him in that direction to, to, to pen eventually in his life. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity, saith the preacher. At my best state, and that was the type that we saw in Solomon. At the best state that man can be, they are nothing but vanity. Vanity and vexation of spirit. Vanity and vexation of spirit. So why do I then think so highly of myself? I'm not at my best state by far. And yet I, I'm haughty, and I'm puffed up, and, and I'm proud in my days. How, how, do I, how do I sometimes sit there and think to myself, man, I, I've got this figured out. I'm really, I'm really starting to, to get into the rhythm of things, reading my Bible, praying. I, I, I've come to the right level. I've figured it out. I've, I've arrived. My, my Christian life is going great. And the Bible records at your best state, you're all but vanity. Why would I think that I've got it figured out? I'm not at my best state. I'm far from it. Even if it looks like I have it together, as David probably did at some point in his life, when he was recorded as being the sweet psalmist of Israel, as being recorded as, as a man after God's own heart, even at my best state, it's but vain. It's just a vain show. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, Surely every man walketh in a vain shoe. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather him. So he just finished saying, every man is at his best state vanity. Every man walketh in a vain show. It's just a show. It's just an act. No man can see the hearts but God. And yet, as we walk in this life, sometimes we start to feel like we've got it figured out. We start to feel like we know what is, is on the horizon. We know how our five-year plan, our ten-year plan is going to work out. I've got this Christian life down. I'm finally starting to get my prayers answered. I'm finally starting to see lots of souls saved. I'm finally starting to, to really gain uh, momentum as far as sanctification and living righteously. And yet, every man at the same time, 
recorded by scriptures by a man who took the time to take heed to his tongue and to muse upon the things that came because of it, realize that it is altogether vanity and every man is just walking in a show, just acting out what they think is right, even if it looks like somebody has it together. It's not ever in us to, to show the truth of what is within us. Verse 7 says, And now, Lord... What wait I for? My hope is in thee. And I love it. He takes the time to muse. The fire burns. He, he speaks out about God and to God. Make me to know mine end. And he understands from that time of musing that his days are but a hand breath. Verily, this is all vanity. I'm just, I'm just pretending. I'm just acting. Every man is the same case, even in the best state. Lord, what wait I for? What am I waiting for? What am I working for? Thee. The answer is thee. My hope is in thee. The. Go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Keep your place. Romans chapter 7 talks about the hope that we have. The hope that we have. Romans chapter 7. <clears throat> As you go to Romans chapter 7, let me read for you Titus. If I can find it. Titus 2 verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify us unto himself, a peculiar people zealous of good works. That revelation there is that our hope our blessed hope isn't just the rapture that comes and takes us away from our struggles. The blessed hope is the fact that Christ gave himself for us. And while we struggle to follow the teaching that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present evil world, the reality is, is that we'll never get there. So we needed Christ to give himself and redeem us from the iniquity that we have and purify us as the people that is zealous unto pure good works. He is our hope. He is our only hope of being what he would expect us to be. And that's the reality that David came to when he understand it's just a vain show. Even if I live righteously, even if I do righteously, even if I follow after good works, it's just me doing the best that I can in a world that is, that is trying to always corrupt me. God is in control and God is our hope in this situation. Romans chapter 7 and verse 18. Romans 7 and verse 18 says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. And this is the reality I believe that David was coming to when he said, surely every man's a vain shoe. At, at, at the best, man is altogether vanity. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Lord, teach me to number my days. Lord, show me what I am. And the Apostle Paul had the same revelation that the, uh, that David had, that many saints before him have had, that in us, in me, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Anything that is good comes only by Jesus Christ. And that's what he's going to explain here. Verse 19 says, The good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. What's he saying here? I desire to do good. I want to do good. My heart is set on doing good. But there is this flesh that is drawing me to evil. The good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I shouldn't do and don't want to do, that do I. Verse 20, now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Okay? So what he's saying here is that he's been born again, right? There is a new man living him. The real Paul, the real Josh Gander, does not sin, right? These things have a right to you that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, right? But the Bible records that there is a sinless man abiding within me. So then when I do what that new man doesn't want me to do, it is no more I, spiritual Josh, but sin that dwelleth in me. What is that? That's the flesh. That's in the flesh that dwelleth no good thing. That's what sin is. Sin it lives still in this body. And that's the part of me that gets drawn away after lust, that gets enticed to do wrong. 
Verse 21 says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And Paul's realization here, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I mean, after all the musing, after all the considerations, after he just took some time, as David did, to keep his mouth shut, to think about the things of God, and go to God and say, God, search me, try me, know me, reveal me to myself. He came to the conclusion that in him was no good thing, that he has a will that desires to do right, but he can't achieve it. He's always going to sin against God. He delights in the law for the inward man, but that other law, the law of sin and of death, is constantly tormenting his members, and he's He's torn apart. He says, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? How shall I be released? Where is my blessed hope? Where is the glorious appearing when Christ shall come? And that's exactly the solution. Verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And so that struggle is always present. And when we take enough time to think about it, when we're in a spiritual position where we're meditating upon God's word, where we've done something like make a covenant with one of our members that we wouldn't do a thing, do you know what that reveals to us? I mean, some people do these things where like, I'm going to wake up today and I'm just not going to sin. <laughs> and then like 20 minutes later, you're like, ah, I did it. <laughs> right? Even faster than that. Just, just, the, just saying I'm not going to sin is the thought of foolishness. You're not. <laughs> right? <clears throat> We take those times, and that's why I don't believe fasting is always just food. I think, I think fasting could be, try something like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to drive my car this week. You know, something like that. Hey, we can fast from things that normally we're used to, and it will reveal spiritual things into us. You know why? Because we have all these things in this life that we become accustomed to, that we become used to, we start to rely on. But the one person that we should be relying on for all things is God. So limit yourself. Take some things out of your life coffee. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's, there's things that you can fast from that have nothing to do with just food. And if, if you take the time, as I believe David did, I will keep my mouth. I will muse on the things of God. He fasted from that for a moment in order to come to the realization that he needs God more than anything. His hope is in God. His hope is in Christ. He looks for the same blessed hope that the Apostle Paul did. He says, I know in my flesh dwells no good thing. I know that every man is altogether vanity, even in his best state. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this? Who shall free me from this problem that I have that is me? I'm the biggest problem that I have in my life. I thank God through Jesus Christ the Lord. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord because he is the one that is going to deliver me from the body of this death. This is our hope. And why is it our hope? Because Jesus Christ condemned sin in the flesh. That's how he was able to release us from sin in the flesh was that he condemned it when he took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. If you were to look, uh, and you can go to Titus chapter 2 right now. We need that blessed hope to come. We need release from this vain show, this vain life, this, this, this our altogether vain state that we are in. And we get that by the grace of God. He gives us as a gift. Verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And he's teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. So everyone wake up tomorrow and just say, I have, I, 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 will, I will set myself, I will take heed that I am going to deny worldly lust. I am going to live soberly. I'm going to live righteously and godly in this world. And then find out how fast you'll fail, right? Find out how fast you'll fall short of even, even a short list like this. But it's the grace of God that frees us from these things. That's why we're looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. And when that happens, the Bible promises, ye shall be changed. Because this, incorrupt, or this corruptible body will be put off and will be raised in corruption. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's the blessed hope. That's the glorious appearing. That's when Christ will come and he will set things right. We will be given a new 
body, we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of eye at that last trump. And that's at the only time when we're finally free of that vain show. We're finally free of that vain life. We're finally free of the law of sin and of death that is constantly torn, tearing at our flesh. He gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, purifying unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. This is what Christ promises. And this is the hope that we have in him. Go back to Psalm chapter 39. And we're now down in verse 8. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. And that is what we're waiting for. The hope of, of Christ. The hope of his return. 39. Psalm 39. Deliver me, verse 8, from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. Make me not to be ashamed before the unbelievers. Make me not to be confounded before the unbelievers as I live. Because he just determined that he, he, is, he is a show at best. He's, he's putting on his flesh righteousness. His flesh is doing what his mind wants to. And sometimes we all agree. There, there were some of us in this room that used to drink. And then the new man said, no, nope, that is no good. And now we are walking in a show. We are showing what the new man wants. The reality is, though, is that the, that flesh, 90% of the time, still desires those old cravings, still lusts after those old things. So we are in a show, right? We are best we can walking before God, letting his word minister to us, serving with the mind the law of the, of the Lord, that, that liberating law, but we are always under that law of sin and death that's constantly attached to our flesh. So deliver me from my transgression. Make me not to approach to the foolish. Because the reality is, is that any one of us can be exposed as hypocrites at any time. Because all of us are sinners. All of us are still constantly falling short of God's glory and getting tripped up and tangled up in the ways of our sinless flesh. And that's a problem that we're always going to have. And that's why our hope is in God. Because that's the only time that I'll finally be able to walk according to his will. Verse 9 says, I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because thou didst it. So I think David here at this time, he was before the wicked. He, he, he took heed to his ways. He kept his tongue. He kept his mouth. He was before the wicked. He was, he was keeping all of these things that he wanted to say in his heart, musing on the things of God. Comes to the Lord in prayer, realizes he's got nothing to offer God. He, he's, he's barely changed as to what the old man that he was. And yet he says, my hope is in thee. And he begs God to be delivered from those transgressions that are bogging him down. He says, make me not approach to a reproach to the foolish. Don't expose me, God, as I deserve. Give me mercy. Give me grace. He says, I was dumb. I opened not my mouth. Because thou didst. And I think that's just a statement. Because thou didst it. God did what David asked for here and didn't make him a reproach. Now we see that David is revealed as, as a sinner. His, his sin with Bathsheba, the murder that he committed. But how often do the foolish open up the Bible and hear about that to David? You know, who do they hear about David and Bathsheba and the sins that he gave? We read them, right? We read through the Bible and we know this story. We know the truth of them. But if you ask the average unbeliever who David is, you know what they think? He's the guy that slew Goliath, right? He's the psalmist. That, that's generally what they'll... Oh, he was the Lord is my shepherd guy, right? So... He kept his mouth because thou didst it. And we see like through the echoes of time, God kept his promise. The world at large doesn't know David in the intimate sense that we do. His, his great sins and his errors later in his life. But they know him as, as the conqueror of Goliath. They know him as the songwriter of Israel. And that's a wonderful promise that God made. And he has that same thing for us. When we ask not to be made a reproach, we're not ashamed before the unbelievers. He says he had no need to defend himself. And why did he have no need to defend himself? Because the mercy of God came upon him. David, just in this psalm, shows that he kept himself quiet before the world. He wasn't a man that always ran his mouth. He was a man that sought the Lord. When he finally got a chance to speak and took the opportunity to speak, he sought the Lord first and foremost. He realized that he was vanity. And even the good things that he does, it's only because God gave him the word that told him what he should do and gave him the, gave him the grace to empower him to do those things. He ultimately recognized that his hope was only in God. I mean, when, when we're nothing, when we're vain, when we're, when we're just, a, just an act before God, before the world, we see very quickly that our only hope is in him. 
Verse 10 says, Remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. So David kept quiet before God, took that time to just meditate upon things. He sought the Lord immediately, realized his vanity, recognized his hope was only in Christ. And in verse 10, he received correction. He says, Remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. I, I've, I, I understand, God. I understand who I am. You've shown me who I am. You've made me to know the error of my ways. And he remained humble through it. And then it ends in verse 11. He says, When thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity, Salah. And there's the pause. He was corrected. He was, he was set right by the rebukes that came upon him. Whenever we're rebuked and exposed by the word of God, it's just like a moth-eating garment. God just shows us all the holes in us. He, he picks away at, at what would be a, a complete piece of cloth and, and puts these holes in it, just like a moth tearing away at fabrics. Our beauty falls away. Our, our, our carnality is, is consumed. We're revealed as what we are, and that's just vain and empty. We got holes in us. We got problems. And yet when we, when we set ourselves to understand that about ourselves... All that does is bring more light to Christ, which died for us and gave himself, and he's our hope. It reveals to us that while we have all these problems, glory to God, there's a God in heaven that loved us anyways, enough to come down here and repair the breach. He took a rotten, tattered garment that was our good works, because all of us at a time thought we could earn heaven. We thought whether we were an unbeliever or whether we were a religious person that we could get there on our own. Tattered garments before God. Filthy rags, the Bible says, is our works before him. He took that moth-eaten, rotten piece of fabric, and he made it fresh. He made it new. He, he revived it, and that's where our hope lies. That's what David is coming to that conclusion. But it's not a problem that we see faults in us. It, it's not, a, it's not a, an issue that when we meditate upon God's word, sometimes we're just like, ah, I broke that. I did that. I sinned. I, and you feel like God's just highlighting all the problems in your life. Do you know what that's supposed to do? Well, if you're a vain and empty vessel, you're just something, someone that is fit for God to fill. <laughs> you, you got nothing left. I'm vain. I'm empty. There's nothing to me. I have nothing to offer a righteous God. But he could take you, empty and lacking as you are, and fill you with whatever he chooses. We need to understand that we are needing before we can have our need provided for. We need to understand that we're sinners before we can save by the salvation that he offers. We need to understand that we are vain before we can be given purpose by the living God. It's good to be an empty vessel because then you can be filled. It's good to be a torn up, stinky, shredded garment because he can clean it and patch it up. Right? It's good to have and re have revealed to you that you've got issues and problems because, because that's, that's the humble mentality. The, 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 the proud person thinks that they have no need of anything. Thinks that they have no lack. Thinks that they're, they've got it together. <clears throat> God wants to take the needy and do something with them. And I love how David says it. He's like, my hope is in thee. He said, I was able to keep my mouth because thou didst it. You've done it all. Verse 12 says, hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. O spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. David just realized that everything's vanity, that, that his life is but a hand breath, that before God, who's eternal, he's just, he's just this little, little blip. He's just this little smoke that comes up. And so he says to God, God, hear my prayer. God, God, this is what I want. He's like, I know, Lord, I'm a stranger with thee. And that's, the, that's almost like the most profound statement of this. I'm a stranger with thee. So who's he's a stranger to? Well, in, in his flesh, the world has that desire to him. But now he's a new man, created. He's a stranger in this world, meaning he doesn't belong here. He's got another home, but he's with God. And I love that. He's a stranger. He's a sojourner with Christ, with his hope, with, with the promise of a return and a salvation that's unmatched. And we're all that. We're all just wayfaring people dwelling in tents. Realize that Abraham was promised... And, and, and asked to go to a land which he was not shown, and he lived out his days and never saw the land. He stayed in tents the whole time. 
He never settled. He never, he never was established. He, he got a promise that, that, that to the flesh never came. But the Bible says that he looked for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The, he, he got his promise, right? It, it didn't appear to the flesh. We're in the same situation. We've got a flesh that's vain, that's empty, that at best is just putting on what it ought to do, right? Our flesh comes under um, the, the, the dominion of a spiritual mind that wants to seek after God. And I can make this, this filthy flesh do Christian things. I can make this filthy flesh live righteously only when it's under the dominion of a mind and a new man that's seeking after God. But regardless, that flesh, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, will never receive the promises that are made. It will never receive of the hope. It will always be just vain flesh. It is made to be put away. There's nothing left in that flesh that is redeemable. There's no redeemable quality in your flesh, okay? So then why do we live so much just after the flesh? Because I believe we haven't done the first step of what David does here. The first step that David does is he, he limited himself of something that he generally uses. I mean, imagine a singer saying, I'm going to keep my mouth, okay? That was something that he loved, something that he ministered in, something that, that helped others. And he said, I'll keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. So he, he took the time to, to fast. He took the time to, to prepare. And when, when he was in that time of meditation, music, he wanted to speak. He wanted to sing. He wanted to, to, to use that. And he realized in that time that he was lacking something. That voice was something that he relied upon. And when it was gone, there was a void. And when there was a void, he said, yeah, God fill it. Okay? I have issues. I have problems. Everything is vain here. This flesh is rotten. This flesh is no good. In me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I need this thing to go away. My hope is in thee. My hope is in Christ. My hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. He came to that realization. And through this journey of, of hearing the word once he decided to be quiet before God. He seeks him. He realizes his place is vain. He's, he's recognizing that his only hope is in God. He's received that correction and humbly takes it to come to another seal on his life where he, he pauses and he realizes, God, I am just an empty vessel that needs to be filled. Deliver me from my transgressions. I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because you did it. You carried me through this. Take thy stroke away from me. I, I, I am consumed by the blow of my hand. I understand, Lord, who thou art and who you are and, and, and what you mean and, and that you are my only hope. You've rebuked me. I've got all these holes, God. Fill them for me. Hear my prayer. Hold not thy peace at my tears. I'm just a stranger with thee. I'm just somebody that has no home. My home is in heaven. I look for that city whose builder and maker is God, and yet I'm here trying to lead about a flesh that has no part in those things. Okay? Before this all ends, before this vain life ends, spare me that I may recover strength. Help me because you're my hope. The final prayer that David says when he's realizing that, hey, I'm living in this life that's vain. My flesh is, is corrupt and corrupting. His final prayer was just, just, God, be with me. I'm a stranger with you. And that's the only way I can get through. Spare me. Help me recover strength. Before I die and this life ends, before that hope is finally revealed, before you come and take me to that promised home, God spare me, God carry me, God hear me, God sustain me. Would to God we would all come to this point where, hey, just, just take away something that you rely on and put God there to rely on. You know, just just re relieve yourself of something that, that you're holding on to, you know. Uh, my old pastor used to say, we, when, when we have things, we ought to hold on to them with open hands and understand that, that these things aren't something we should come to rely upon, right? God gives me something, a tool that I can use, hold on to it with open hands. You know what that means? While I have it, it's mine, but if someone should remove it, I'm not going to clench it. I'm not going to hold on to it. You know, too much in this life we grab a hold of, and all of this life is vain, so what does it matter? Take something that you rely upon, that you're trusting in, that you've perhaps even gone to the extent of making an idol out of it. Take something, get rid of it, and then muse on what happens as God shows you you didn't need it. Because we don't need anything but God. 
He's our hope, right? He's our assurance. He is our salvation. He is our life, right? We rely on too many things in this life. I said I will take heed to my ways, that I sit not with my tongue, I will keep my mouth with bridle while the wicked is before me. When you do things like that, when you limit yourselves, when you when you stand before God as David did, quiet, and then come to him and say, Lord, make me to know me. Reveal me. Where what am I lacking? Where where have I failed you? Where am I struggling? Okay? I hear you, Lord. Thank you for the rebukes. You, you, you've taken the beauty away of the thing that I thought was great about me, and you've, you've revealed it to be moth-eaten and corrupt. Lord, hear my prayer. Walk with me as, a, as I'm a stranger in this life, but I'm with you. Spare me, recover me, carry me through this until you come back and take me out of here. My hope is only in thee. Who shall deliver me? I thank the Lord Jesus Christ that one day he's going to come and deliver us from all this mess. And we won't have to worry about the flesh is constantly holding us down and causing us to struggle. And the flesh that we really ultimately rely too much upon. Right? We, 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 we grab a hold of things in this life when, when our, our promise and our hope is the same as Abraham's. Right? Abraham walked around in tents. Right? He, he never got in the flesh the promise that was made. But now, he doesn't feel ripped off for it. Right? He's got it. He's received it. Let's just look to the spiritual things and start to put off the things of the flesh. And it can start something like this. Just, just fast something. Go without something that, that you really just are constantly needing, right? I need this every day. I, without this, I would, you know, and just, just cut it off for a day, a week. See what happens. Let God to speak to you and show you that, that while you may think that that thing you're missing is a hole, it's simply just a spot where God can show you that, that he has filled it, he is all sufficient, he's all you need. Christ is all you need. Amen.